came about. The the Confessions album was a good was a good album for me. We ended up ended up with three on that album. Uh, oh. Did Red Light with Sean and Carrie. Yeah. So that ended up being a lot of fun. Yeah, that was an amazing body of work, and you guys delivered on it. Um, and then kind of take me through that timeline because you worked with Carrie on that record. Was that the initial start of the clutch, or just take no. me through the history? No, not at all. Carrie and I, uh, Carrie's like one of my first co-writers, period. Okay. Uh, like Carrie is my little sister. Like Carrie's the godmother to my children. Mm. Like I've known Carrie for a very long time. When I first did my publishing deal, uh, before anybody was paying me any attention or yeah. paying her the attention that they're paying her now, uh, we were both locked in my apartment, you know, writing, oh, wow. trying to figure it out. So, yeah. um, so that was, that one was, uh, it was a given that at some point in time, Carrie and I were going to write something together. Um, mm -hmm. That one just came about because she and Sean went to write Red Light um, and then called me and was like, yo, we, we feel like we could really use your help on this mm. one. So uh, they gave me a call and and I went in and we were able to uh, to turn that one around. Right. Oh, <laughs> nice. Carrie Hilson. Yes, Carrie Hilson. Yep. <laughs> so from there, JQ, like you have a couple of placements on the biggest album at that, at that time. Did the doors open up for you right away or was there still a grind period after that? Um, the doors opened more so than they had been open. Like for me, oh. I had I had written a few records and had, yeah. I guess, a few singles by that time. Like yeah. I had done, um, was one of my favorites before then. And it wasn't a huge single, but it was this record called That Girl on Marcus Houston that Neo yeah. Um, yeah. had done that and some records for an artist named, uh, what was his name, Little Corey. And yeah. I'd have a few <laughs> records that, that, were, that were really cool for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but after, yeah, it was, what was dope about it to me is I was able to get every meeting I ever wanted to get. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it happened. And then my, like, uh, publisher hit me and was like, yo, what do you want to do? And I right. was like, I want to meet Clive Davis. And two weeks later, I was sitting with Clive Davis. Wow. Um, which ended up leading to like the, uh, Fantasia, Truth is record. Yeah. So it was it was a lot of just kind of stair stepping. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Just one record and never really got too caught up in the in the hypeness of it. Right. And just trying to link that to another record. Right. Take me through that Fantasia record, Truth Is, because that was such a great record. Even the concept of it, it was a great one. Thank you, man. I would love to say that it was like this crazy deep. Uh, situation to happen but that's that's yeah. not it like um when we <laughs> wrote, i wrote it with um with a friend of mine named tab and uh okay. soul and carlin produced it yeah. um we were in la we had sat down with soul and carlin and we were like yo we're gonna do a record and they gave us the record and at the time tab and i were staying in um we we're staying in malibu uh, at a mm. friend's house who had a like a pro had a house on a private beach. So we were just loving being in Malibu. And we went out there and to be completely honest, we didn't write anything. Like we wrote <laughs> nothing. And then the next day, it's time to go to session. And I'm looking at Tab and he's like, look, man, you gotta come up with something. Right. So we hop in the car, turn the track on and um, write it on the way to the studio. We just right wrote the whole song in the car on the way to the studio. And we got there. Crazy shit is we actually wrote the record for Tony Braxton. Yeah, wow. wow. Played it for Tony and they said they didn't like it. Wow. That they didn't like it. We were heartbroken. Um, I remember I went to Japan to do some, to do some writing in, in Tokyo. Yeah. And I got a call from Soul and Carlin saying, yo, Fantasia cut it. 
yeah. um, it's going to be the single. And I was like, oh, snap, awesome. <laughs> three days, not three days, like a week later, they called me and said, okay, it's not the single. It's not even on the album anymore. Oh, what? <laughs> and then I was like, oh. And then they called me back. Okay, no, no, no. We're tripping, we're tripping. It's the single again. And wow. it ended up coming out and being real, like, real dope. And meeting Fantasia was cool. She's, like, from North Carolina, so that was amazing because that's where I'm from. So, yeah. so just really, really cool connect. Really cool connect. That's amazing. It's funny you touched on, you know, you, went, you were in Tokyo at the time. I want to touch on some of that work you did in that world in a, a bit oh. later because there's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot that I need to ask you about that stuff, but let's just go through some of the stuff that people recognize for now, you know, after Truth Is. And, uh, you know, the time that I really got to know you was during the Clutch era when you yeah. guys came in and gave us so many different types of hits. The concepts yeah. were crazy. Um, I spoke to Ezekiel probably about a couple of years ago, and he was just talking about how that whole Clutch situation came about. It was like a writing camp, and you guys just – ended it up was, working really well together. Like, just take me through that. It was the most random situation ever. Um, I remember it because I was in, um, we were in Miami. Uh, but right before we went to Miami, I got a call from my publisher asking if I would be interested in doing a writing camp. Um, mm -hmm. I said, no, not really. Right. And then I got a call from Carrie who Carrie and I uh, were already trying to do, were trying to build the clutch. This was an idea that nice. I had long before we did it. Um, mm. Carrie and I's group was called the Writer's Block, though. Okay. So we, we uh, Carrie hit me and she said, I'll go if you'll go. And I was like, well, I'm going to be in Miami anyway, because that was the weekend of the BMI Awards. And we were out there. It was a really good weekend. We ended up winning, like, Song of the Year. Wow. <laughs> it was a really cool, it was a really cool weekend for us. Um, so Carrie said she was going to do it. And I was like, all right, Ben, if you'll do it, then I'll do it. Yeah. And we go down and we sit in this room and our publisher at the time, me and Zeke's publisher and, uh, and Tab's publisher, Hit Co. Yeah. Um, and Carrie, Candace, and B were signed to Universal. So Universal and Hitco got together and they said, we're going to send three, you know, people that we think play well together. Hitco said, we'll do the same. We got down there. Um, it was the weekend of, it was the weekend of Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. That's the weekend it was. Because I remember the power going out and everybody, like all of us being scared, but people in Miami are so used to hurricanes. They were literally yep. still partying. So, <laughs> um, so we, so we go down there, and I remember we, we were in the studio for the weekend. Yeah. Um, that weekend, we wrote six songs. Um, we recorded five. Yeah. We left Sunday. By Tuesday, four of them were placed. Wow. And we were, uh, this is the crew all here. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so we... Um, so we messed around and four of them were placed immediately. And we just kind of looked at each other and said, well, you know, maybe we should get together once every two months. Right. And just try to write something since this went well. Um, the next week, we got a call from Larry Jackson. Okay. We got a call from Larry Jackson at J Records that was like, yo, we heard you did this, this writing situation for, um, for Sony. Uh, yeah. went well, J-Lo took all these records, blah, blah, blah. How come you didn't count us in? Yeah. And he was like, well, we want one now. So they flew us all to um, wow. out here to L.A. And we did a week. And um, at the time, uh, before we completely refined our process, like we were turning out so many records. Because right. they would put Carrie and I in one room. And then yeah. like Zeke and Candace in another room. And Carrie and I would do Carrie and I would do two songs a day. Zeke and Candace would do two songs a day. So if you put us in, you got four songs a day. Right. So everybody kind of just started calling us, asking us to work. And wow. um we did a few records. 
and a bunch of them got placed. And um, and not too long after that, you know, we we got called again. Maybe like two weeks later, we got called from Interscope uh, Geffen. Wow. A and M, and they were like, "Yo, how come we weren't part of this whole clutch thing that we're hearing about?" And Zeke and I came up with the name, the Clutch, in oh. um, in L. A. We were all sitting around, Zeke, I, and my publisher, we were sitting around and we were like, yo, we need a name for this. Like, like, but we, it's gotta be, it's, it's gotta be solid. Like, like we need to be the people where if there's two seconds left on the clock, we want the ball. Like we right. want the last shot. And some, right. and, uh, Zeke was like, we gotta be clutch. And I looked up and said, the clutch. And he was like, ooh, <laughs> oh yeah. So we just kind of started calling ourselves the clutch from there. But then we got the call from Geffen. And that week, we did a couple of records for fan, a couple of records that ended up going to Fantasia. But more importantly, on our third writing trip, we ended up doing Take Me As I Am for Mary Jane. Mm. Yeah. And the second that that one caught, it was kind of wildfire. Like, yeah. for the next maybe four years, we were booked and this crazy thing is we never went in to write together right. unless we were booked and we went in to write we were booked like 52 weeks in a year maybe 46 weeks of the year for the next four years right we're just always together so wow. we started to figure out we were like along the way we we're like yo we just got to figure out some rules like no nobody ever expected it to go the way it did but we were like, yeah. yo, we should just figure out some rules. If we're going to be together this much, you know, we do this, we don't do that. We figured this is, had to figure out how to, you know, make splits happen. The crazy shit about the clutch, though, and nobody, specifically other creative people, never believed this. Um, it was the easiest work I think any wow. of us ever did in our lives. <laughs> um, our process was super weird because individually we all had yep. pretty dope discographies alone like yep. we'd all written like some pretty good records before yep. so when we got together by the time we were rolling like literally the way our process would go is we'd sit in a room um they play us some records and it we kind of hit a niche market because these labels at the time had these song deals with producers and they had all these tracks, but they didn't necessarily have songs. Mm. So we became the people that they called for the tracks that they had that were already paid for. And they right. were like, you could just give us a song to this. So we like, we just kind of leaned into it. But the way our process really went was we'd get in the room, play the track, we'd all just sit and listen to it for a second. And Balewa was at the time for us, he was the concept king. Okay. Like he was just somewhere different. So yeah. we'd all be sitting in the room and B would go, yo, what if we call this uh, record like a boy? And everybody, you know, girls always saying if, if I was like, if you, I got treated like a dude, you know, if right. I didn't do, then it'd be different. And we go, okay, cool. <laughs> then everyone would split to separate corners of the room. Oh, wow. And we would all write what we want to write. Wow. And then we would just come back together in the middle of the room. And the way that it ended up working out by the end is they'd hit play. Balewa would start singing the first verse. When the hook came in, Zeke would start singing. And then Candace would sing what she had, or I would sing what I had. And then, um, then we'd work out the bridge. And then when it got time to go, like, and the, all of our records were built that way. Wow. So like, a lot of people would hear it and go, yo, it's crazy because it, you're, it all had moving parts and nothing felt the same. It was because we worked oh, together, wow. but at the time we, that we were really working, we didn't think it through together. Like um, everybody, we wildly respect what Zeke brought to the table. We right. absolutely respected what Balewa brought to the table. In my opinion, in my opinion, Candace Nelson was the most talented of all of us. Yep. Like yep. Candace, Candace was a unicorn. You know what yep. I mean? So it was, 
it was amazing and it was super, super easy. Like wow. I remember, I remember doing this Britney session and it was ridiculous. Cause by that time when we really figured it out, we're in writing for Britney and, um, and we, oh my God, I remember it was the weekend. It was the week the iPhone came out. Mm. The week the iPhone came out, we're in the studio Con at Conway writing for Britney. And we had the same situation. Like we all, we get to the studio and if our session was eight hours, we would literally goof off for five hours. Like, so we get to the studio, we're sitting there. I call our assistant engineer in because we traveled with our own engineer. And I hit him and I'm like, yo, bro, I need something from you. And he's like, absolutely, JQ, what do you need, sir? I <laughs> need to go to the Grove and stand in line at the Apple store and get me an iPhone. Mm. And he's like, that could take hours. Yes, it can, bro. I need you. So he runs, <laughs> to, the Grove, he runs to the Grove, stands in line. And we're all sitting around laughing, doing nothing. And wow. the phone rings. Like, and at the time, we always had ridiculous things. Like, we always asked for something ridiculous. So we'd have them buy us all of these old school board games. And for that session, for whatever reason, we all had, like, gym whistles, where we're just all blowing whistles. I no <laughs> idea. Um, but they go get us all these games. And we're just in there laughing, eating fruit, you know, doing nothing, calling friends, and the phone rings. And I pick up the phone and I'm like, yo, what's going on? And they're like, JQ, you got to have a visitor. Oh, well, who is it? And they're like, it's Teresa. Teresa was Britney's A&R. Wow, okay. So we've been in the studio for like four hours and we haven't done anything. <laughs> so they're like, Teresa's out here. So we're like, so I tell everybody, Teresa, He's like, yeah, she wants to know, you know, where. And we're like, yeah, yeah, send her in, send her in, tell her where we are. I hang up the phone. Our engineer, Dave, starts a track. And we're just all sitting around. So when Teresa comes in, we're all pointing at each other like, yeah, you like that? Yeah, I like that. Oh, that'd be crazy. <laughs> that'd be crazy. And Teresa comes in, and she's like, oh, you guys in, you guys feeling it? We was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is going to be crazy. <laughs> this is going to be nuts. And she goes, oh, let me hear it. And we go, you, Teresa, we don't like doing that. Like, like we got to go our, work our way through it. Let us get finished with it and let you hear it. And you'll love it when it's done. And she was like, okay, can, can you at least tell me what it's called? And everybody's eyes get big. And we're looking around and Zeke looks in the corner where we have the game stacked up. And there's a game called Trouble. <laughs> and she looks at the game and goes, Trouble. She was like, Trouble? Yeah, yeah, the record is called Trouble. It's going to be crazy. And she was like, <laughs> Oh, I love it. I can't hear any of it. And Zeke goes, Trouble, 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 Trouble. And she was like, Oh, I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> she leaves. Wow. Then we all sit down and go, Okay, well, I guess we, we need to write something that's going to make sense with that. And we write it, and it does end up making the album. Wow. But all of our, <laughs> like, all of our sessions while we were with The Clutch were that fun. They were that magical. Like, there was, wow. never, there, was nev there was literally never a session that we didn't feel like we were going to absolutely nail it. And the mm. only thing that worked is when the artist needed something. Like, the, with Icebox and all the records just like that, it worked the same way every time. That's crazy. <laughs> it's amazing just hearing the process because like the one thing that always stood out to me about the clutch because at that time I was probably around 15 or 16 so I remember those songs coming out and just the concepts like when I listened to a song like Store Run by Trey Songs. Yeah. Like I don't know how you wrote a song like that with a straight bass because <laughs> that song was hilarious but it sounds so good. <laughs> Bro the, the, the crazy thing is we have a lot of that came out dope like that, but we also have one or two that fell so flat that we just yeah. never let anyone hear. We'll never let <laughs> anyone hear. There's one song that if you ask anybody in the clutch, next time you talk to Zeke, if you hit him yeah. or just DM him, just ask him, hey, bro, what's Buddy Box? 
Buddy Box. <laughs> Just ask him what Buddy Box is and watch his reaction. It, it may be the worst song the Clutch ever wrote. Wow. <laughs> it may be the worst record we ever wrote. And we wow. were like all feeling it. And we write it and we come back the next day and hit play and go, all right, we were tripping. It's just terrible. <laughs> Take right. it, like you told Dave, get rid of the session, delete the session. We don't want anybody to ever hear this. So, wow. So that was a lot of, we were, back then we were definitely, we were very fearless. Like we just, mm. kind of, like we couldn't miss. So we just shot all the time. I mean, that thing's come out, but let's talk about Icebox. I see a lot of comments here. Like the concept of that song, even the title of it, like it's, it was so unique at the time. The sound was crazy. Just talk about making that one. Okay, absolutely. Icebox, the situation of Icebox was so, Icebox was a little different uh, for, oh, look, Sean, Sean's in here. Sean Stockman's here. <laughs> Sean, don't, don't start with me, Sean. I have a Zoom call with Sean a little bit later. Um, oh, okay. But um, we were not cocky, Greg. Um, Greg, is, Greg Smith, who's in here, is, is my big brother. Like, literally, my mm -hmm. big brother. Um, right. Icebox, we were, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I stopped and started reading some of the comments and that's why I'm laughing, I apologize. Yeah. Um, okay. Eric, <laughs> Eric Dawkins, there are a lot of amazing, like legendary R&B, R&B, a legendary artist and songwriters in here right now, so shout out to all of them. Um, and shout out to yeah. my big brother, Greg, who actually pushed me to do all of this. I just kind of grew up wanting to be like him. And that's how mm. I got here. Yeah. But um, Icebox, here's the crazy thing. Icebox is actually a story about me and my wife. Mm. Icebox is a real story of my life. Um, the way Icebox happened is we got a call from, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It's okay. it's cutting off though. My picture's frozen. I just uh oh. All right, we're gonna try to add him back in here. Does that boot him out? Let's take a look here. We'll try to get uh, we'll try to get JQ in here. <laughs> Sean, <laughs> come on, Sean. Let me uh, let me do this interview. <laughs> He's good. All right, let's uh, let's add him back in here. All right, let's. I don't see him in here though. I see him in the chat, but I don't I don't see him in the box. JQ, can you add can you send a request? I can't find you on here. Alright, I see him. Alright, you're back. Alright. Sorry. Oh <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, what we ended up, what ended up happening is we got a call from uh, KP saying we need we need a single for O. Um, okay. I had worked with O on the Pandemonium album, and I just kind of loved the way, like, of all the artists that I've ever worked with, I like the way Omarion delivers delivers my songs better than anyone. Mm. Like when he sings them, they just energy wise and attitude wise, they sound the way it sounds in my head. Right. So, um, so we get a call and I'm like, all right, cool. You know, let's, let's knock it out. I was in LA working with the underdogs. So I was like, yo, I can just, I can shoot over there. You know, like I can cancel my session tonight and get over there. Yeah. So, um, so KP's like, cool. We're going to do the session at six. I was like, perfect. So 5.30 comes around, I'm hopping in the car, my phone goes off. And it's KP going, yo, JQ, the rest of the guys missed the flight. So oh. 
we're pushing the flood, we're pushing the session back until eight. And I was like, um, okay, eight o'clock is fine. So eight o'clock, I drive up to the studio, like 7.45, eight o'clock, I'm at the studio and my phone goes off again. And it's KP, like, yo, such and such happened. We're going to have to push back till 10. Wow. I was like, yo, I'm at the studio. I'm looking at Amari. Like, I'm looking at it. Uh, I can't push back. I can't just leave. And he's like, all right, well, just go ahead and get started. And, you know, everybody else will fill in when they get there. Mm. So I'm like, perfect. No problem at all. So I sit down and I was like, yo, we have two tracks. They both came from Timberland's camp. Um, and I'm like, cool, well, uh, let's hear the tracks. And he plays, the first track that comes on is a track from Icebox, and it just comes on, boom, just, boom, boom. and I'm like, yo, I like, like, I like dark, moody music. It's my favorite yep. stuff. So yep. it comes on, and I'm like, oh. And then he's like, okay, let's listen to this other one. And he plays the second track, and it's, t like, it's an up-tempo song. Yep. And he, if you know, oh, he immediately starts dancing and is popping around. And I'm right. like, yeah, I want to write the, I want to write the slow one. And I, he's like, okay. So I was like, well, just let me listen to it. The joint comes on. I'm sitting there listening. It's maybe 20 seconds into it. And Omarion goes, hey, uh, I want to write a song called Cold. And I go, mm, no. And I look back <laughs> down. And then he goes, why not? And I'm like, well, I said, if it's going to be a hit, it needs to be a hit from top to bottom. I said, if you have 13 records on your album, nobody's going to look at the, the titles and go, oh, I need to listen to that record cold. I was like, it just doesn't grab you. I said, right. so it needs to be interesting. And he goes, okay. So he goes back to the back of the room. I turn the music back on. I'm listening. And then he goes, yo, uh, JQ, what if we call it Icebox? And I go, no, nah, that's whack. And I close my eyes again. And he goes, you said it had to look good. And he turns his computer around. And when I see the title, I'm like, OK, I can't even front. That looks, yep. that looks really good. So right. I said, all right, give me a second. And I start the music. And it comes on. And I'm like, my, box where my heart used to be. Got this ice box where my. And he goes, woo. And I go, all right, bro. You like it? I love it. And I sing that into my phone, like into the dictaphone. Icebox, yeah. and he's like, "Yo, that's great, that's great." So um, I stop it and I go, "Okay, well, Icebox, what is Icebox about?" And then it reminded me of a conversation that I had with Polo the Don when I was still trying to get on. And Polo mm -hmm. told me one time, like, "It's us versus them, like guys versus girls. That's what it is." And I was like, "Yeah, bro, I don't think that's what it is." And then he looked at me and said, you ain't never really had your heart broken. The girl ain't really messed you up yet. He right. said, after you, get, after you get crushed, come back and holler at me. <laughs> and a few years later, I, I got crushed. So wow. I told him about it. I was like, because I think all dudes, in a lot of cases, are pretty solid until the first time they get really messed up. And yeah. then they kind of go into dog mode. So, and I tell all oh, this. And O was like, yeah, let's write about, let's write about that girl that broke your heart. And I was like, I've heard that record a thousand times. Right. Why don't we write about the girl that has to deal with you right after that girl? I said, I don't mm. know that song. And he was like, yeah, yeah. So I said, okay, give me a second. Turn the music back on. I'm sitting there and I'm like, <laughs> I really want to find out. I really want to work it out because I'm tired of fighting. And he goes, "Woo!" And I go, "Great! <laughs> you like it? I love it." And I sing it into the phone. And then I was like, "Well, let's flush that out. Like the icebox part is fine." So I'm sitting there, and it happened. It happened super fast. It doesn't happen fast for me all the time. Right. Um, but maybe in 30 seconds, I'm like. I really want to work it out because I'm tired of fighting. I really mm. still want it the way I want you. And then, oh, sing something else. And I was like, I don't think we should keep adding words because it's going to be too much. So let's come back to, I really want to work it out. Now, girl, I'm trying. It's no excuse, no excuse. I got this icebox. 
And O is like, oh, that's crazy. And I'm like, bet. Yep. <laughs> In my head, it's easy for me to write at that point because I've, I've already figured out what I want to write about. And that is about, uh, I'm singing, I'm writing a song to my wife about my mm -hmm. ex-girlfriend, Elle. Yep. So for me, in my writing process, um, I don't write until I can see the whole thing in my head. So a lot mm. of people, I'll be in the studio and everybody will be throwing out ideas and I'll just be sitting here like this. Because to me, it's all a movie. And the second that I can see the movie, then I just write down what I see. I don't have to make anything up. I just right. write. So... I know exactly what I want to talk about. I know exactly where I want to go because it's a conversation with Vivian. So I'm mm. literally just like, I've had, I had that conversation with Viv where I know I, I got post, it's like post-traumatic post -traumatic okay. stress syndrome. Like I know I'm treating you the way I'm treating you because of her. Right. I, and I know you're nothing like the girl that I used to know. And I, like I say that lyric in the song. Right. So, so uh, we write, like I said, the pre-chorus and the chorus all happen in maybe one minute's time, like collectively. Right. One minute, it's written. So we'll like, so we're like, all right. And O's like, let's finish writing it. Now, for me, I know my arrangement with the clutch. Everybody's getting on this record in mm. session. So I tell O immediately, "Hey, bro." The energy is amazing. We should just start recording. Because if everybody else is going to get cut in, I think everyone else should write. Yeah. So O's like, bet. And he gets in the booth, and he sings the, the hook melody, and he sings the melody for the B section. And then wow. he dips. And I'm like, yo, you should go ahead and go home. So he goes home. I call a really good friend of mine, Tony Dixon. Yeah. Uh, Tony's, I've written a lot of records. I wrote Best Thing I Never Had with Tony. I've written, wrote Four Minutes yeah. with Avant with Tony. I've written a lot of records with Tony. Um, yeah. I call Tony, who has put me on to so much work. And I call Tony and I go, yo, I'm over at Larrabee. I'm working on something that I think might be special. Get over here. If you can get over here, get here, get here now. So Tony stops doing what he's doing, comes over there, the rest of the clutch, oh, which is at that time, I think only Carrie and Zeke came out. Yeah. So they go in another room and they start writing the verses while I'm cutting with the Marion. Because yeah. inside of the clutch, I probably cut 95% of the records. Like I cut okay. on the artist. Um, so O Dips, Tony, Carrie, uh, Zeke come in the room yeah. and they sing the verses to me. And I'm like, yo, the verses are amazing, but that's not what the song is about. And they were like, well, this makes perfect sense. And I was like, it does make perfect sense, but it's not what we're talking about. Mm. So we're like, I'm like, the melodies are gold. Like, I couldn't yeah. do any better with the melodies if I tried. So we sit down and, like, we go back through it with me explaining mm. like, the situation. And we write the song and... And then later that night, I go ahead and I sing, like, I sing all the background on that song. I'm singing all the, the harmonies and the, and the, shut up, Eric. So I'm singing <laughs> all the harmonies and everything. And, um, and we cut it, and Omarion comes back the next day, and we play it for him. And he's like, oh. <laughs> and, and he hears, I went ahead and cut the verses. And he's like, bet. And he records the verses. It sounds amazing. Little side note that a lot of people don't know. Timbaland is not actually, he doesn't have nope. any vocals on that record. It's I Zeke. know, right, yeah. Yeah, yep. I call Zeke yep. and I'm like, yo, I need you to get in the booth and, and sound like Tim. No. Yep. <laughs> and so we cut him until he sounds like Tim. Tim comes in, um, Timbaland comes in from doing, I think, late night, some late night talk show. KP, who's the president of the label, comes in. I've told Amarian 15 times that this is going to be his single and it's going to do well. Um, whenever I work on a song that is going to do, that's going to connect, I have a very physical reaction. Like the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I, my eyes start to water every time. So 
I'm sitting in there, hairs up, crying, listening to the playback of the record. Yeah. And um, I'm telling, oh, yo, this is the one. Yeah. So Timberland and them come in, and we hit play. And I'm swagged out, chest out, knowing we're going to murder it. I think while the record's playing, I might jump up on, the, like, the credenza in the middle, <laughs> just going at it while the record's playing back. And it goes off. And Timberland goes, hmm, okay. He was like, well, Sean Garrett got the other record. And it was the Temple record. So I really think they were looking for a Temple record. So he was yeah. like, well, let's just wait to listen to see what Sean did with the other track. Yeah. You know, before we make a decision. And he says that and O looks at me and I completely deflate. Like I'm confused. <laughs> because yeah. in my head, this is a no brainer. So they leave the room and O is like, Man, I thought we had one. And I was like, Me too. And then maybe two minutes later, Tim walks back in the room and goes, Yo, 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 play play that ice box again for me. Play it again. I think I like that. Immediately, swag comes all the way back. <laughs> the song comes on. Yep, the other song was begged for it. Exactly. Yeah. Remember? Um, so the swag comes back, play it. They end up loving it. Another, another note, they go to mix the record. Uh, the label doesn't like the way the mix sounds. So mm. the record that you guys hear, the one that came out, is actually the night we recorded it. It's the rough mix that I put on the record from the night mm. it was recorded. Never went and got mixed again. So it was. Mm. So that process was was like, it was a whole lot of fun. I, I think any of us that create are capable of writing the record by ourselves. Yeah. But for me, there's just something fun about the co-writing process. You know what yeah. I mean? I just kind of yeah. feel like if it's fun the record will feel fun. And mm. I think that's the most important part of it. Right. That's a, that's an amazing story. And then you you mentioned a song that you did with B2K. That's the song, song Sleeping, right? Uh, I, on that album, yep. I, yeah. Actually, I'm singing all the backs on Sleeping as well. If you listen to Sleeping, the chorus, that's yeah. me. Um, that's a great song. We did Sleeping, Tease, okay. and My Girl. I did those okay. three. Yep, and the Usher remix, the Usher remix, uh, the remix for Icebox did have Usher on it. Yeah. That record, the, the remix actually came about because I was, I just flown in from somewhere. And I'm walking through the airport and Usher slaps me on the back on my shoulders. Scares the hell out of me. <laughs> He's like, yo, and I'm like, uh. I'm like, what's up, nigga? So I dap him up. And um, he's like, yo, you know Icebox should have been my record. <laughs> you know that should have been my record. And I was like, yo, bro, like, we wrote that with Omarion in the studio. Like, yeah. there was nowhere else that record could have gone. I was like, man, but if they did a remix, and he was like, yo, if you do a remix, I'll do it. And we're talking mm. about in the middle of walking through the airport. And I was like, for real? Will you really do it? He was like, you do a remix on everything, I'll do it. And I called KP. And I was like, yo, Ush said he'd get on the remix. And he's like, well, write the damn remix. So we wrote <laughs> the remix. We wrote something that we thought was amazing. We go to New York. They send me to New York to cut it with Usher um, at Sony Studios. I go in, I press play, like, mm-hmm. And Usher goes, I'm not singing this. And I go, wait, mm -hmm. what? And he was like, I don't want it changed. Like, we wrote a whole different story. Melody's different. Uh -oh. Like, no, I want to sing Icebox. Oh, wow. So I was like, all right, cool. Like, you're going to have to write another verse. So we sit down, and I just rewrite the verse with him there. Mm. I rewrite the verse, and I go, and I'm singing it to him. And he was like, yo, I love that. I really like how you did confessions and burn and how you brought all that back. Let's cut it. So he jumps in the booth, cuts it. Usher is, Usher going to Usher. There's, there's yeah. nothing you can do. He's got one of the coldest vocals ever. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and then Amari, we, when I go to cut it with Amari, it was funny because O heard it and immediately said, oh, no, he ain't about to out-sing me on my own record. We don't <laughs> sing it until I get it right. And then O went in and killed it, and Ush came by, and it was just, it was really, really cool. The vibe was really, really cool for that one. That's amazing. Um, and then the other record I wanted to talk to you about was Four Minutes by Avant. Because what you guys did there, like that song is actually four minutes long. So you guys had to fit everything into, you know, four minutes. Like yeah. how challenging was it to write a song like that? The crazy thing is it wasn't, four minutes was a super interesting co-write for me because I wasn't there for most of it. Oh. Um, it's like the, the idea of four minutes came from Tony Dixon. Okay. Uh, and I don't know the way it happened after the fact, but it's like, he told me the idea. And at the time, Carrie and I were always going up to the underdogs to write with Tony. Cause like right. Tony and Eric Dawkins were kind of specific for me, Eric a lot, because I'm a gospel kid. So Dawkins yeah. and Dawkins and just what he does vocally is stupid. So melodically yeah. and everything. So I'm amped to be up there anyway. But Tony's like, yo, um, I got this record, I got this idea, I did this track. I want to call it Four Minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, what's Four Minutes about? And he was like, you messed up with your girl and she's like packing her stuff. And she's like, mm -hmm. she's like, you got four minutes and I'm out, <laughs> better spill it all. So we're like, all right, cool. And Tony starts putting the track together and I'm like, all right, well that works. And then we go ahead and we write the record. We like, we write four minutes. And I'm like, yo, I love this. And then Tony calls me. I remember he called me, it was like, yo, I was back in Atlanta. He was like, yo, Avant's uh, taking four minutes. And I was like, right. yo, awesome. I was like, let's get these splits together. And then when the splits start coming down, I'm like, wait, who are all these, why are all these people on four minutes? <laughs> like, right. what is this? And he was like, oh, I had, I, had to, I had to flip it up a little bit to make it happen. And I was like, man, what happened? And from the best, I think, that I got from Tony is he went in and pitched the idea the same way he pitched the idea to me, but didn't tell them that the song mm -hmm. was written. So then just went back and used, like, our hook, or a lot of our hook, and messed around and and they rewrote the rest of it. Oh, and wow. The way it all went down. But from the, when we wrote it alone, it was four minutes long exactly. And mm. you know, between Tony, um, Eric Dawkins, uh, Harvey Mason, um, I don't know everybody that's on there. Steve was on it, whoever was on it, these yeah. guys are all phenomenal writers. Like they're, they're the guys that I look up to. Yeah. You know? And when I have questions and when I need guidance, these are the guys that I try to surround myself with because I still learn from them. They're like fountains of knowledge. So, you know, just being able to be on a record, being able to say that I had a record with all of those guys was, was well worth, you know, losing a couple of percentages. Point, That's like incredible. Couple of points. It was not better when you did it, Eric. Shut up. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, you got to send us that version then, and we'll decide here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Eric can't be singing it. Because Eric, Eric is like a cheat code. Eric can sing the ABCs. And you're like, yo, we need to put that out right now. Wow. So, so Eric is a cheat code. So you can't, you can't. <laughs> Eric's voice, Eric, Eric Tank, uh, jo, Jojo. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of people that sing so well that it doesn't matter what they sing. Everything yeah. sounds like a hit. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So let's fast forward a little bit. I just want to quickly mention Carrie Hilson's album. This has been a pet peeve of mine for years. The song Return of the Favor, which I know you were a part of. Return of the Favor. We did that in New York. They, ch they changed the hook on the official version of the song, and that's bothered me for years. So you're the first clutch member I've brought that up with. So I'm just going to tell you that right now. <laughs> Man, it's always like a lot of that is always so weird for me because like you write songs and you, you, you make these records and they're like your babies, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But 
once, and they're, but they're like gradual or grown up babies because once you let them go, there's not a lot that's in your control anymore. And you just kind of roll with, I'm trying to get it so I'm not so super bright. Um, <laughs> you, you, you do the records and then it's out of your hands. Right. Like they do the powers that be do whatever they feel is, is, is in the best interest. And, and a lot of that stuff, specifically when you're talking to Timberland or talking about yeah. Timberland, I defer to what Tim thinks. Like we've been blessed enough to work with Tim for a long time. Pussy cat carry without question. Like, no, I think want to say like, yeah. And Tim, I was able to, I connected with danger because of Carrie and Tim. Yeah. Um, Pussycat Dolls. Uh, what was one that we did that I really loved? Oh, actually, I actually have a record. I'm uh, waiting for it to come out uh, that I did recently with Martin Garrix and Timberland. Okay. So it's like just being able to being able to work with Tim. And Tim, Tim knows, like, I don't, I've never been able to explain to people how much Tim knows. Uh, if you want to know what Tim's style is like in his writing and his vibing style, listen to the Justin Timberlake record, Carry Out. Okay. Or it might be Timberland featuring Justin. Yeah, I think it's yeah. Tim featuring Justin. Yeah. Um, you'll hear what Tim does. Like, when the song comes on, it's like, oh, oh, I don't know, no, I'm baby, what you carry out. No, 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 no. That's what he does. In a lot of cases, mm -hmm. he'll mess around. Like, Tim is such a vibe person. So the song will, like, he'll be in the room, and they'll be just jamming until they hit a vibe that he thinks the groove is crazy on. Like, he's groove-oriented. And the second the groove is good, mm -hmm. he's like, all right, we're building from here. And in a lot of those cases, like, we did one record, uh, I think it was just me and Zeke. Zeke and I did a record with Tim for, uh, did a record with Tim for Genuine called. All right. Was it Get Involved? Get involved. Called Get Involved, yeah. 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 Um, with that record, it might've been me, Zeke, and B. But I definitely remember Zeke. Um, they mess around and Tim does the track. Like Tim and Jer Jerome do the track. Same way I'm sure it happened with Carry Out. And then Tim jumps in the booth. And he'll just vibe for a second. And he'll mumble the same way he did on Carry Out. No, no, man, no. Carry Out. I promise you, that was just him vibing down the record. Because he did the same thing with Get Involved. And then hopped out the booth and said, yeah, right to that. Call it Get Involved. Mm. So I promise you, Tim with that, that's what he does. No, 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 take it. Carry out, but I want my baby to hurt me out. <laughs> and they just filled in words. So, wow. So with like the, go, to take it back to the carry record, uh, if Tim heard it and was like, yo, I think we should do this, bro. Yeah. I, I listen to Tim. I listen to Tim and, and even though we, <laughs> even though we make bumps, bump heads every now and then, I listen to, yeah. uh, to Kenny. I listen to Babyface, both of those. Mm. Both yeah. of those guys, if they say they kind of feel like this is the way it should be, then that's the way it should be. That's actually how best thing I never had happened. Mm, love it. Yeah, I, I, I probably would have still disagreed with Timbaland on that, but he has the hits. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to leave that one alone. But let's talk about that Beyonce record as well as Ariana Grande's Baby Eye. I read somewhere that you did those two songs like back to back. It was like all in that same time period, right? Yeah, two days. They were my yeah. first. They were my first two sessions um, after the clutch. When the clutch, when we uh, when we disbanded and broke up in the clutch, um, it was it was really difficult for me. Like mm. it was really difficult for me because I'd spent every day, like almost for four years, in the studio with these guys. So when it broke up, it was really difficult for me to deal with a lot of the emotions mm. that with being in the studio without them because I associated the studio with the clutch. It's all right. I knew for a very long time. Yeah. Um, so I'd go to the studio and then I would just end up not being able to, to perform or produce the way that I needed to. You know right. what I mean? Our job is one of the few jobs, I think, that the way you feel 
like your vibe actually matters. Yeah. Like if you're if you have a bad mood, then if you're not writing a bad mood song, you might be in trouble. Right. So, <laughs> so I ended up calling my business manager and telling him that I was going to take like a month off. I'm just going to have a month, just not going to do anything. I'm going to hang out with my new baby um, and kick it. And that yep. month turned into way, way, way longer than a month. Like for a very mm -hmm. long time, I ended up doing pretty much nothing. Um, and I remember being like, all right, it's time to get back into the studio. Um, and I remember calling Tony and just being like, yo, Tony, what's going on? And for the first time ever, he rushed me off the phone. Like he okay. picked up the phone and he was like, yeah, yeah, what's going on, Q? I can't talk right now. I can't talk right now. I got to go. Click. Wow. And I was like, what was that? <laughs> so Tony calls me like a day or two later and was like, yo, you know, you got to keep this quiet. No one, no one can know this. I was like, well, what's up? He was like, well, I was in the studio with Beyonce and Kenny. And mm. I'm like, yo, congrats, bro. Get it in. And then he was like, yeah, well, I'm telling you this because Beyonce loved what we were doing, but she said she feels like some of our, our melodies and lyric choices feel a little old. Mm. So she wanted us to, to figure that out. He said, and I told Kenny that he needed to bring you in. He said, because I think you do what Kenny do, does just for a younger crowd. Okay. And, which is funny because L.A. Reid signed me. He gave me my, he gave my first publishing deal. And he right. signed me because he said my writing reminded him of baby faces. Okay. So to be in the room with Kenny was amazing to me. Uh, we go in and again, I haven't been in the session to write in a year. Mm. So I get in the room and I'm like, all right, let's nail this. And I walk in the room and I look at Babyface and freak. <laughs> he is like, ah, oh, to me. So yeah. I look at him and this is my first interaction with him. And I'm tripping. I'm like, Yes, baby face. We can do this, baby face. Yes, yes, Mr. Baby Face. And then like, yo, Q, you gotta stop that. He doesn't like being called baby face. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry, Mr. Baby Face. I won't call you baby face anymore. He's like, call me <laughs> Kenny. Okay, Mr. Baby Face. And I just can't stop. So I'm right. already freaking out. Like I'm already freaking out. And we start writing this record. And the record is Baby Eye. Mm. Um, and we were writing it for Beyonce, because at the time she was doing a 90s throwback album. Yeah. So we start writing and Kenny's like, so I'm thinking this and I'm thinking this. What do you think about this? And like when Tony is in the room, I'm completely at ease. And I'm like, yeah, well, I kind of feel like this. Let's do this. Like Tony was my security blanket. Right. But then knowing Kenny now, he kept asking Tony to leave the room so he could see what I was like. Yeah. But when Tony would leave the room, I wouldn't be JQ, uh, a Grammy, BMI award, multi-platinum writer, yeah. producer. I turned back into Patrick Smith uh, from Anniston, Alabama. Babyface fan. Go, <laughs> I turned back into Babyface fan. So yeah. like, there was one time I remember specifically, he was like, well, what do you think about this? And I was like, well, I think maybe we should go this way. And he went, mm, well, I was thinking we should go this way. And I was like, oh, you're right. Damn, damn. Come on. Uh -huh. get together. And he <laughs> looked at me and I was like, oh, I'm, bro, I'm fumbling. I'm fumbling. I'm messing up. So, um, <laughs> so we end up getting through it. Like we write and I finally pull it together enough yeah. to get through the song and I remember Kenny leaving and the way he left I knew I was never going to see him again in my life like I wow. just done a terrible job and um I look at Tony after Kenny leaves because this is on a Saturday on a Friday on a Friday and Kenny's leaving he's like I gotta go to Vegas to see my mom so Kenny leaves he's like nice meeting you he dips I look at Tony and I apologize. Look, bro, I made you look like a fool. I'm sorry, this is my fault. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to make it up to you. And he was like, well, we'll give a few months and then I'll try to reintroduce you and maybe he won't remember. And um, 
I was like, bet. So we get ready to leave, and then Tony goes, but I do have this track that I did that I thought could be cool for Beyonce. And he hits the track. And like I told you before, it doesn't always come to me fast. Yeah. But the track comes on, and immediately I hear, do 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 and Tony was like, I want the song to be called Best Thing I Ever Had. And I'm like, do, 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 best thing I ever had. And Tony's like, yo, that's nice. And I was like, I hear it. Can we just write it? Let's just write it now. Mm -hmm. So we write the song. And I tell Tony, yo, let me record it. And Tony's like, no. And I was like, <laughs> what? He was like, because you need to sing it to Kenny. You, he needs to see you in your element mm. to understand that you're talented. Yeah. So Kenny comes back a few days later. I'm stupid nervous because yeah. I messed up. I folded so bad last time. Mm. And, um, and Tony hits play, and I sing the song to Kenny, heart beating out of my chest. Right. Sing the song to Kenny, and Kenny goes, I love it. Let's rewrite it. And I go, yeah, wait, wait. You love it? And you want to rewrite it? And he's like, yeah, I just kind of feel like there are certain things that could be a little better. And yeah. I'm like, okay, bro, you baby face. Whatever you say. So we start to, the rewriting process, and Kenny was like, yo, let's just change this B section. I just think the B could be better. So I'm like, oh, okay. All right, perfect. So we rewrite the B section. Um, when it's done, it's different to me. It's not better. Mm. It's just different. Right. But you're the one that's got, like, he's got to sell it to Beyonce. So if he thinks it's the answer, it's the answer. Yeah. Um, so the second we get done with the B section, he's like, hmm, well, now the B section doesn't flow into the, into the, ver into the uh, chorus the way it needs to. Let's just, yeah. let's just tweak the chorus. So I'm like, oh, okay. So we tweak the chorus. When the chorus is rewritten, I don't like the chorus. Just, mm. I don't like it. So we started, we finished that. And then Kenny goes, mm, now that we did that, let's take a look at this verse. And then I just <laughs> look, and I don't, I don't have the best poker face. And when he says, let's take a look at this verse, I just look at Tony like this. <laughs> Tony goes, Kenny, Kenny, if you don't like the record, just let's write another record. So Kenny was like, okay, let's, let's do another song. So we write another song. Um, the next day comes and it's time for me to leave. So yeah. tell everybody bye. I'm headed out the door. Tony comes running down the hall and is like, yo, Kenny wants to talk to you. I think this is the point where Kenny tells me, I need all of your publishing for me letting you get on this record which I'm ready for. I'm like, all right, cool. Whatever for Kenny, whatever we got to do. Right. But when he calls me up into, and Kenny has this like this, it's like a little apartment in his studio that most people don't know is there and they never get to see. So he calls me up into the upper room. So you were saying you went upstairs? Yeah. So I go upstairs into the upper room. You know what I mean? I run up there to try to figure out what's going on. And instead of him asking for all the publishing, he actually just says, Greg says, we need to call Fadia. Yes, we do need to call Fadia. Um, Greg's like, uh, not Greg, I'm sorry. Kenny's like, yeah, I really enjoyed writing with you. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, just Tony and I have to go to New York this week and do a week in the studio with Beyonce. Mm. I want to know if you could make it. Wow. And I look at him and I think I may go and excuse the language. I went, baby face and Beyonce? Shit. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so he starts laughing and I'm like, oh, my, my bad, bro. My bad. Yes, I would love to go. So we get to New York and the, we write another record called the, making excuses or a million excuses one of those okay. we write another record and the energy is just amazing yep. and 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 kenny looks at me uh and he goes hey i want to take another look 
at that best thing record. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. He was like, the, the energy is just different here. He said, I went back and I listened through the record again. Um, it doesn't need as much work as I thought it did. Mm. I was like, okay. He was like, and then he baked like, and it's wild. If, if you know Kenny, you can see him turn from Kenny Edmonds to Babyface. Like, you can watch it happen. Like, so he's like, he's like, you, you got to take a different approach to it. He was like, best thing I ever had. That's cool. But best thing I never had, mm. he said, it's different. And I'm like, that is different. And then no. he starts going, and Kenny, Kenny has a better, Kenny has a better understanding and grasp, a better command of the English language than anyone yeah. I've ever met. Like he understands how to evoke emotions with the fewest words possible. Right. So he starts going through the song and it was real it was a master class. Like yeah. he starts going, look, you gotta you have great um like your ideas are great, your instincts are amazing. He was yeah. like, but you have to start paying more attention to the little things. He was like, mm -hmm. like if you're writing a love, it's not a love, it's the love. You need to mm -hmm. understand that as a songwriter, your lyrics are one of your weapons and you can't leave anything to chance. You need to say exactly what you mean. And he goes back and he starts changing one or two words all the wow. way through. And when it's done, he begins to sing it. And like he runs into the booth and he starts to record the song. And I have a video in here somewhere of me in New York turning the camera like to me and with Kenny in the back going, baby face is recording my song right now. This shit is crazy. I can't believe this. And he, re and he sings the song. And it's amazing. And he steps out of the booth and I'm floored. And I am floored hearing his voice on it has me like ready to cry. Yeah. And he sits back and he goes, that's almost right. It's almost right. And then I'm like, okay, okay. Well, what would make it right, Sensei? Tell me Yoda, <laughs> like what, what, would, what would fix it? And he goes, we need ear candy. We need the, like a, an earworm, something that people are going to hear one time and they're going to know. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then Tony slaps Kenny and goes, like, on the shoulder, bow. Oh, that's easy. That's easy. And I was like, yeah, yeah, Tony. And Kenny goes, it is? And he goes, yeah, Jake, you can do that in his sleep. He's, wow. he's, he's the king of that. And hits me. And Tony and Kenny who I've been afraid of since I messed up, go, no. all right, cool. It's, if it's easy, just go ahead and write it right quick, Q, so we can go ahead and finish. Yep. Now I'm feeling super pressured because Babyface <laughs> is looking at me like this, and he still does this. When I'm writing, he'll look at you, and then he'll just keep getting closer and yep. closer and closer, and I'm getting more and more worried that my brain is going to be blank. And... um. And I'm looking at Tony, and Tony looks at me, and he says something that he says to me all the time. And I think it's one of the reasons that Tony and Kenny probably keep me around. Um, he looks at me and says, young and dumb. And it's something that Tony and I do all the time. Like, I'll just start making a song about the stupidest thing ever and just laughing in the studio. So he goes, young and dumb. And I'm like, young and dumb, young and dumb, bet. Turn the track on. So the track comes on, and I'm sitting there. Tony actually just, Tony just stepped into the I room. I see him, yep. <laughs> um, so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, all right, young and dumb. Tony done put me on the spot. Please don't freeze up, JQ. Babyface is looking. Beyonce is in the next room. We got to get this right. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, 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 okay. The track comes on, and I'm like, what goes around comes back around hey my baby what goes around and Kenny goes that's it and Kenny just runs into the booth mm. and 
things. What goes around comes back around. Hey, my baby, what goes? And when he comes out, I'm like, yeah, but chop it up a little bit. Goes around, comes back around, my, 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 my baby. And they fly it in, and we press play down, and Kenny goes, that's it. Mm. That's it. They run in, and um, they run to the next room and grab Beyonce. Wow. And Beyonce comes in a room, and it's like the light of the Lord <laughs> has entered. Wow. And I'm like, yo, because this is the first time that B has been in the room with us. Like, she stepped in when she got there and just kind of waved and went to work right. in the other room. So I'm like, yo, it's Beyonce. So um, Kenny's like, yo, listen to this record. And they hit play, and it comes on. And when we did it originally, the track was different. It had a yeah. sample from like the show. So it was up tempo. Um, and it comes on and Beyonce literally begins jumping up and down and runs out of the studio. And then runs back in with Ty Ty. And they play the song again. And she's like, I need this. I need this now. And they give the session to her and she walks into the next room and takes maybe an hour, records the entire song comes back, plays it, all of our minds are blown. And on the playback, we're listening to it, and Tony and um, Kenny are up at the front of the room at the board with Beyonce. And I'm yeah. sitting in the back of the room, and Kenny turns around and goes, come up here, come up here with us. <laughs> and I'm like, I know I'm not gonna be able to keep it together. So mm. I'm like, oh, you're fine, you're fine. <laughs> back of the room and watch them laugh and and you like just listen to the song and I meanwhile I'm secretly snapping pictures you know uh. and ended up being real cool we ended up doing another song on that project that came out overseas called Dream. dreaming yeah yeah and that yeah. record was actually amazing and it it really showed me who Kenny and Tony were yeah because that record was done yeah. Like that record was done. Beyonce had laid vocals. They just needed a bridge. Yeah. They just needed a bridge. And when they got ready to write the bridge, like they bring it up and they sit up there and then what's up, Willie? Uh, so they sit up there and they start to write the bridge to Dreaming. Like paying mm -hmm. his vocals and I'm sitting there like, oh, this song is going to be amazing. And I go to the back of the room and I get on Twitter. And then Kenny turns around and goes, what are you doing? And I was like, <laughs> well, the, the song's done. I don't want you thinking that, uh, that I'm trying to force myself on anybody's record. Like, it's just a bridge. Y'all just finish it up, and I'm ready, and I'm ready for the next one. And um, he's like, no, no, that's not how a team works. You get up here mm -hmm. and write this song with us. Wow. And I got up there and, like, just wrote on them like wrote on the bridge with them. And it yeah. was it tripped me out because when the splits came out, when it was time to go over the splits, yeah. um, Kenny's assistant sent me the splits. And my split said 33 and a third. Oh, wow. And to me, I was like, I called Ann and then I called Tony. Ann was his assistant at the time. Uh, no, I may have texted them both. And it was like, yo, um, just heads up. Uh, there was a typo. Like, mm. it's... Like, it's a bridge. So I'm like, it probably should read 3.3% instead mm. of 33.3. And uh, Tony called me back and was like, no, welcome to working with Babyface. Like, <laughs> we, all, we were all on the song, so we split it evenly. Wow. And I was like, what? <laughs> huh? So, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Kenny, Kenny made me comfortable Kenny made me very comfortable with my writing style. Before then, mm -hmm. even though all of these other records had happened, I was still very uncomfortable with the way that I created. Because mm -hmm. I would be in the room like, I don't know if you've ever written with Neo. Uh, yeah. Neo writes very fast. He's very efficient. He's amazing. I don't know if you've ever been around John Tay Austin. He writes incredible records, and he writes them very quickly. Yeah. Nobody on God's green earth can write faster than the dream can. Mm. No one. 
I've seen him write a song, an entire song in three minutes. So I was always very uncomfortable or insecure with the way that I wrote because I liked, I liked to think it through. Right. And Kenny, it was the first, like, I remember writing with Kenny and someone else and they're trying to write fast. Yeah. I'm like, no, because, you know, and I ask a lot of questions, like things that don't have anything to do with the actual song. I just need to understand the backstory. Like if we're right. writing a heartbreak song, um, how did they get broken up? Like, did, did the person, did she have to break up with him? Um, did he cheat? Did she cheat? Like, even though these aren't the lyrics of the song, I need to understand how it happened just so I understand what to write. It all influences the, the way that I work. Right. So me talking to Kenny, I remember one time I'm talking the song through and somebody's like, Q chill. And Kenny's, Kenny stood up for me. Kenny was like, no, you guys stop. Keep going, Q. And I'm just <laughs> talking it through. And he was like, yes, now you're going the right way. And I'm like, she's not sad. She's frustrated. We got to stop writing sad lyrics and write frustrated. And Kenny was like, exactly. And the first time Kenny did that to me, I was like, okay. Even though I would, I remember telling people all the time, yeah, you know, everybody creates differently. It's yeah. easy to preach that, but I, I was always still, like even inside the clutch, uh, there were moments that I was insecure with the mm. way that I worked because Sometimes I didn't move as fast. Like Balewa is fast. Zeke yeah. is fast. Uh, Candace is fast. Carrie is fast. I can be fast, but that's not my default setting. Right. So like Kenny, Kenny made me very comfortable with moving the way that I moved. It was like, if it takes you an hour to write a song, if it takes you a day, if it takes you a month to do one song, as long as the song is a hit, I don't care how no. long it is. So that <laughs> helped change my perception, you know, and mm. make me way, way, way more comfortable with, with my own creativity. That's amazing. So pretty much all I took from that story is that Tony Dixon is the MVP. <laughs> oh, you got to understand. Tony, Tony is up. He said, B, B. Cox in here? What up, boy? Um, Tony is better at setting up the play and delivering the play than mm. most people know. Mm -hmm. Than most people know. Like, Tony is one of the, in my opinion, Tony is one of the unsung heroes. Like, I'm not saying that the underdogs wouldn't have been the underdogs because, be clear, Harvey Mason Jr., no. um, Damon Thomas, you can't argue with their creativity. No, at all. no. You can't no. argue with any of it. Like what they did, what they've done since speaks volumes to who they are and what they are. Like they are amazing. But I can promise you the way that it happened, the, the way the sound developed would not be that sound without mm -hmm. Tony. It would not wow. be that sound without Eric. So it like, the, the guys are amazing. Yeah. Without question. And we know a lot of the people that are in to the to the uh, to the liner notes and reading all that. But a lot of other people just don't really know. And I wish and I I wish that they got more more pub for it. I wish that more people knew. So whenever I get the opportunity yeah. to talk about any of my friends, you know, I do that. I would talk about Beacons, but clearly we, <laughs> we all know. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, JQ, I got to talk about this aspect of your career. You mentioned it earlier. You did a lot of work overseas in Asia. Yes. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to, to go to Japan, go to Korea, go to Hong Kong, and I see how big R&B is over there. And, yes. uh, I mean, first of all, just talk about the work that you did over there. And then, I guess, more importantly, the question that I ask is, why is it that the R&B over there, I don't want to say it's better, but why is the R&B over there, why does it sound more like the R&B that we love compared um, to the R&B that's out here? I think it's because the R&B, like here, music, 
I don't want to say they're, well, I do want to say it. So let me just say that. And mm -hmm. you like, everybody take it and do with it what you want to do with it. Music is not appreciated here the mm -hmm. way it is appreciated there. Um, yeah. And no matter where you go, people are going to have their, their own things that they're into. You know yeah. what I mean? But when you go over there, it's a lot of, it's fun because they still care about progressions. They still yeah. care about melodies. If you're going to go over there, you're not going to, every now and then I get around and think about a foul way. They're going to be like, no, bro, we need some, like, yeah. a song. we need a song. And it's just mm -hmm. cool because they really buy into, um, they buy into R&B. Like, yeah. specifically, I, I think it matters over there. Like, I've thought about this a lot, actually. I think it yeah. matters over there specifically because, and I'll take, like, Korea, and people yeah. laugh at me for this all the time, uh, or, or Japan, they're, the, the number one religion is not Christianity. Mm. I think it has a lot to do with that. We grow up, a lot of us, specifically with R&B, we grow up in church. Like, we grow up, soul matters. Like, and what yeah. we do is soulful. There's no, like, people love Jodeci. I don't think people understand that when they listen back and they listen to Jodeci, one of the reasons that Jodeci really hit yeah. Is because they were literally singing gospel music and just singing some wild stuff on top of it. Like <laughs> the chords and the melodies, everything was gospel. And I think when it's pure and when it's soulful, you know what I mean? It touches people. Here in America, I believe that we have been getting that soul for so long that we just kind of take it for granted and we've moved on to other things. Over mm. there, talk to artists there. And they're like, yo, that's why karaoke is one of the reasons karaoke is so big for a lot of us, because we didn't yeah. grow up in church. We never got that. We didn't get to hone what we do and learn how to do all that in church. So that soul that is innate to you is not innate to us. Right. So I feel like I feel like they appreciate it differently. Right. You know what right. I mean? So it's it's yeah. It's awesome. I've been working my one of my first one of my first like real credited placements. Uh, first record I was ever on was actually My Boo. At night I think of you. Oh. That's the first record I ever did, like out of high school. Um, right. But one of my first one of my first uh, credited joints was actually in Japan, and B Cox is the one that put me onto it. Mm. Like a group called the Gospelers, who Brian and I still do work with, yeah. um, called and set up the session with B. And B was like, "Yeah, he's gonna." B was like, "I'm gonna produce the um, the track." And he was like, "JQ, will you come in and cut the vocal?" And I was like, uh, "I don't, I don't really speak Japanese, bro." Yeah. And he was <laughs> like, "Me either." Uh, he's like. But if you come in, like, I can, I can get $100 to you. And, bro, when I tell you I was so broke, yeah. I was like, hell yeah, bro, I'm there. So I <laughs> rushed to the studio, getting ready to uh, cut these vocals. And we get there, and the group says, uh, no, we actually wanted to sing an English song. Mm. And Brian looks at me and goes, Yo, you feel like writing a song? And I go, and at that time, I was at um, noontime getting groomed. Like I knew how right. to write a song, but they taught me how to make a record. So how to make it sound like a record. So right. I was like, yeah. And I was just happy because it was finally, I finally getting a chance to try to get on something. And uh, we write a record that ends up, they end up taking, and we end up working with them some more. And Brian and I ended up giving them their biggest hit to date. Like it went to number two in Japan okay. and made that group more of a household name. Mm. So, you know, that kind of started everything. So for me, the work in Japan um, or the work overseas has always been natural. 
Like I was working overseas before I was working in the States. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, because I was going to mention one of the records I checked out was a record called Body Calling. Like that just sounds like an R&B song that we hear here. But it was. It was, it was yeah. So I wrote that with, uh, with Teddy Bishop, also from Noontime. Yeah. Um, and they were like, yo, we just, we'd like some songs. So yeah. I sent them that song. And they were like, we love it. We'll take it. <laughs> and here's the wild thing. And if B is in here, B is going, I'm sorry, Brian, I got to tell him. Um, and it's understandable. That song happened not long after 9-11. Um, 9-11 had happened, and immediately after it, the second they started opening up us being able to fly again, Japan, like, they called us and asked me and Brian and Teddy to come to Japan. Right. They, Can you guys come over here and work. And I'm like, yes, like, I absolutely want to go to Japan. Bro, when I tell you, Brian misses the first flight. And uh, I'm there, and then the second flight, misses the second flight, misses the third flight. And it's wow. like multiple days until Brian just goes, hey, look, man, I'm just going to have to be honest with you guys. I don't feel really comfortable with flying right now after 9-11. <laughs> and they're like, they're like, oh, bro, we totally get that. But why didn't you just say that up front? And Brian was like, I apologize. He was like, I had every intention of getting on the plane. But every time I get to the airport, I'm like, yeah, no, it's not happening today. So, mm -hmm. uh, so we ended up, Brian and I still ended up on that uh, project. It's crazy because I have um, maybe the plaques hanging up here. I want to say mm -hmm. Brian and I have sold maybe just with that group, maybe four, 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 at least four million records in Japan right. with the group. So it's, it's, Absolutely love them. Every time I go to Tokyo, specifically, I make sure I catch up with Yoichi. He is, he is a dear friend. So it's just, yeah. it's amazing. Uh, just the last question, because I'm really curious in, in just the Asian market for R&B, like financially, how does it compare to here? Because when I was in Japan, they still have record stores with like CDs from back to front, like filled with albums that you can't even find in the stores here. Like what's yeah. that market like? Like, it's, it's so different because, you know, the U.S. is a huge market, period. So yeah. you're going to move more units in America. There's just, there's no getting around that. Yeah. Um, but specifically, if you start talking about the Asian market, that's yeah. the number two market in the world. And if you start talking about physical copies, yeah. it is now the number one market in the world. Yeah. So you go, we go over there and we work and just keep it 100%. Yeah. The fee that you're getting up front is not going to be the fee that you get in the States. Um, sure. But what they, and specifically speaking to Korea, because I do a lot of work in K-pop. I, yeah. it's actually, I have more fun writing K-pop right now than I have writing anything. Mm. Um, but there, even though they don't hit you with the big check. Right. And they may not sell as many units off the gate, off the rip. You get so much work that it begins to even out. Like yeah. they just put out a record on a group called um, NCT, NCT 127, mm -hmm. uh, that came out that's came out earlier, a little earlier, a couple of months ago, maybe, that yeah. we wrote maybe three years ago. Mm. Like we write the records and what I love about specifically the company SM, which is where we do most of our work. Yeah. Um, you, do a work you do some work with SM and they tell you up front, we like this record, this record, this record, this record. Like the crew that I go with, we usually go for like four or five days. Um, and I mean, that's with travel days. Um, but in the three or four days that we're in the studio working, we usually turn around 17 to 18 songs. Our, the wow. highest time we did, we turned around 21 once. Um, and with that, they listen through the songs and they tell you, we like these 11 songs. And you can bet at some point, those 11 songs are coming out. Wow. So I enjoy, I really enjoy working with that company. 
You know what I mean? That's I haven't awesome. done a lot of work with other companies, maybe just one other company there. But yeah. I enjoy, like, I enjoy, I enjoy going over there. And, you know, my wife is Korean. Um, mm. So it's also really cool for me to yeah. get to, pull, to post pictures, like, uh, on Facebook with Boa. Right. And, yeah. Like, my in-laws and the family over there, everybody is like, Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, so that's really, that's really cool for me. I, I really enjoy that part of it, too. Right. And then I just want to add on, uh, we're almost out of time here, but I know the, the fans over in that K-pop world, they're going to stream the heck out of every song. That's just yeah. what they do. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, JQ, selling, we're, out, we're out of time. The, yep. the selling of it is actually the dopest part, because, like, is it? specifically with, um, with, what's up, FC, with, um, like EXO, uh, yeah. EXO's, they're massive. They're huge, yeah. Like you'll do a record and because they're putting out the Korean version and the Chinese version, like yeah. it's one record and ends up being two placements. Yeah. And then because they still sell physical copies, mm -hmm. they mess around and like every, sometimes every member of the group is going to have their own run with their face on it and then the wow. super fans go and they buy every copy so yeah. like i want to say the last exo album we were on like pre-orders were at like eight hundred thousand or a million wow. pre-orders so it's like you get you hook up with the right right places and it's amazing like the i have a friend named krista youngs that is living the bts life mm. It's like an amazing business to be in right now. Wow, that's amazing. So, JQ, that's all that I've got for you. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, no, man. I, bro, I appreciate you uh, reaching out. It's, it's specifically in this ridiculous quarantine time. Yeah. It's really cool, you know, that, that you're – it's really cool that you're doing this. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's really cool that you're connecting – and and connecting a lot of creatives yeah in this way you know we don't get to talk to to a lot of the people that do that listen to our music all the time so this right. is this is like really oh somebody said what was the hardest song to write oh if and i don't know if we even have time for that but i i definitely answer a couple of questions yeah um, absolutely Go ahead. I, the hardest song i ever had to write I don't, I don't know. I, I know my favorite song I've ever written. Favorite song I've ever written is a song called um, Music Box. I will not let anybody record it. Oh. I have no idea why. It's just <laughs> really close to me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just kind of a weirdo that way. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take uh, we'll take another question here, and then uh, we'll wrap this up. If anyone has any questions, <laughs> but just going crazy talking about the group. I used to I was in a group called Melange with my brothers, and, okay, uh, my brothers and my cousin, um, and it was one of our it was one of our records. Wait, somebody mm -hmm. said, "How do you remain human with all of your success?" Um, I'm a human. That's really yeah. much. Um, I think, I think the 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 best way to to process, you know, what it is, is to just remember that. Is to just remember that you need to take the the job seriously, but not yourself. Yeah. Like it's really it's really easy to get lost in this thing. You know what I mean? Right. It's really yeah. easy. People get really caught up all the time. And to me, it's just remembering that, bro, I'm not, I'm not curing cancer. I'm not curing COVID. Um, I am very thankful. You know, side note about me, most people don't know. Um, I never wanted to be a writer. Like this mm. was never my plan. Even when I got into music business, this isn't what I wanted. 
Um, So for me, I just remember that it's, it's a job. This, this is what I do. You know what I mean? It is not who I am. Music is absolutely a part of me, but I do not associate myself and my worth with my ability to write a song. Like for me, it was always there. You can ask my brothers, you can ask anybody. If people ask me what I wanted to be, I always wanted to be a dope father. Like Mm. I wanted to be a great father. I wanted to be a great husband. And it just happens to be that my job allows me the, the ability to live the life yeah. that I wanted to live. Like right. if my son or my daughter has a bad day, I can call Tony or Eric or, you know, any of the people that I work with and just say, Hey guys, I'm sorry. I can't come in today. My family needs me. Yeah. And for me, that's it. Like, yeah. I think you remain humble and you remain really in touch with that humanity when you start remembering and this I try to remember this all the time I'm a kid from Alabama yeah like I'm a kid from Alabama like I was born in North Carolina but I did a lot of my growing up in Alabama um and for me I just always remember somebody had to give me a shot Mm. like so it's it's ridiculous to me when I meet people who feel like because they've written a record, it it puts them, yeah. they're more important. Like that's, right. that's absolutely ridiculous to me. Yeah. And I, I've learned, at least for me, those people don't stay around very long. Yeah. Like they just don't stay around very long. I write songs, uh, I produce some songs, I do a lot of vocal production, but the reality of it is there are people who are just as good or better yeah. than I. The yeah. difference, I think, is making sure you build that relationship because you could be the most talented person in the world, but if people don't like you, the yeah. second that you do not have the hottest record, your career will be over. Like yeah. your ability to work will always be directly tied to your chart positioning. You know what I mean? I've never built that way. B. Cox and I, we definitely do work. But when I call B. Cox, out of 10 times me calling B. Cox, two of them will be talking about work. Mm. I'm calling B. I'm, yo, how's the boy? What's going on, bro? I'm just checking in to see if you are right. Like, that's it. And that's my relationship with Tony. That's my relationship with Eric. Like build friendships, yeah. like build friendships. And then, you know, work with people that you like working to. Also, I do not write nearly as much as all of my friends. Like <laughs> I meet people that write a lot. I don't write as much as they do. I have a high placement to single rate, to single ratio. Mm. Like my, my ratio to getting the record place and it being the single single is probably higher than some of my friends, yeah. but that's because I believe in writing when I feel led to write right. and writing a song that I think is important. Mm. But I tell a lot of young writers that they ask me, what if you had a piece of advice, my advice is write something that is special to you. Absolutely special. Cause like when we did Icebox, I remember yeah. running into LA at the studio. Exactly, Viv. That's my baby, Viv Smith. That's my wife. She is my muse. Be clear, and none of this would be here without Viv. None of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I ran into LA, I remember saying, yo, I got a record I want to play you. And he was there with his entire A&R staff. And I walk upstairs and he goes, yo, can I have this record? And those that know LA know this is the truth. He was like, can I have the record if I like it? And I was like, no, it's placed. And he was like, well, don't play me the record. Why would you play it Mm -hmm. for me? And I'm like, yo, like I'm signed to you. So the way I figure this is your money anyway, you telling me you don't want to hear your own money? And he kind (laughs) of laughs and I play him the record. 
and the song goes, and it, before it comes on, he always asks me the same thing. Is this a hit? Lights a cigar. And I'm like, it's absolutely a hit. And I play the record. And there have to be 12 A&Rs in the room. Mm. 10 of the A&Rs. 10 of the A&Rs hear Icebox and tell me, and tell L.A., because he asked the entire room, what do you think? Yeah. 10 of the A&Rs tell a and R, tell L.A., this song will never happen. It'll never, it'll never work. Right. Like Memphis and, um, and Ray Romulus. Ray was an A&R then. Um, right. Ray was like, no, okay, what y'all saying? This song hard. And L.A. looked at me and said, so you still think it's a hit? I was like, yes. He said, so they wrong? And he pointed at the whole room because we're all in the room, sitting in a circle. Yeah. He's like, so they wrong? Yes, all them niggas, except for them two niggas right there, are wrong. <laughs> They're all wrong. And then, you know, it messes around and goes to, I think it topped out at number three. Yeah. And I remember walking through Lenox Mall and L.A. grabbing me around my neck one time. Like, caught me off guard. I was like, yo. And he was like, uh, he was like, hit maker. He said, you were right. You were right. Yeah. So I tell him all the time, write a record that is special to you because everyone else is going to doubt it. Like, everybody's mm. going to you, you don't have, everybody's going to tell you you don't have the sauce. Everybody. Wow. So you have to create, create something that you're ready to fight for, you know, not just trying to follow like a trend. Following the trend is the worst thing in the world. I meet people that right. write, when they called and asked me to write for the Confession album the first time, they called wanting me to write a song like You Remind Me for Usher. Mm -hmm. They were like, LA heard that girl, he thinks you can write another You Remind Me. But what we ended up writing was yeah, we wrote what we wanted to hear Usher to sing. Usher sing, right. not they were asking us to write. So right. I write something that you think is special. That's amazing, JQ man. I appreciate you for taking the time out to do this. We uh, we definitely want to support everything you've got going on. So just keep us posted. And Thank thanks you, once again for your contributions to R and B. All right, bro. I appreciate you, man. Thanks for reaching out. Absolutely. We'll do this again soon. <laughs> All right, bro. I'll be waiting. All right, take care. All right, All right peace.